Uh, welcome to a reprise of Sally Rand's Frank Lloyd Wright House. Uh, this originally appeared uh, <clears throat> at the Zoom meeting of the Glendora Historical Society the last Monday of September, uh, and we had a couple of difficulties with that, so we are going to link this to the uh, website of the Historical Society. More on that later. We'll, in fact, we'll advise anyone who uh, wants to uh, take a look. A um, <clears throat> little bit of background here. Uh, I was first introduced to Frank Lloyd Wright when I was a little kid, and we lived in Berkeley, and my uh, mom happened to mention that our doctor, Dr. Hargrove, had a Frank Lloyd Wright house, which seemed like a big deal. Uh, I didn't know anything about him, of course. Um, and it turned out that he, he had a house designed by Wright. Uh, it, it appears in lists of Wright's work, but it was actually never built. Uh, I don't know why, maybe it was too expensive, uh, rent, uh, Wright didn't have too much concern about budgets, but in any event, uh, that's how I first learned about Wright, and then when I was in college, I took an extension course from UC Berkeley on Frank Lloyd Wright, and we had a chance to visit a couple of his buildings in the Bay Area and meet with Aaron Green, <clears throat> who was a, an associate of Wright's, uh, who was a, at that time a prominent architect in San Francisco. And he took us over to the Marin County Civic Center, which was the last building that Wright designed and he died before it actually went into construction. It was Green who shepherded it through. So with that background, I gave a, a talk to the society a few years ago about segregation in, in schools, or excuse me, in theaters in uh, Los Angeles. And a couple of the members invited me to join and then invited me to join the Historic Preservation Committee of the Society, which I did. And Sandy <coughs> Krauss and uh, Barrett Oliver, who were members of that group, both asked me, knowing a little bit about uh, my background, both asked me, do I know about the Sally Rand House built by Frank Lloyd Wright in Glendora? And no, I didn't. And then they said, well, I th we think it was along Sierra Madre Avenue somewhere. So I cruised Sierra Madre Avenue, didn't find it. And so that led to this search. And we see a phrase similar to this, Sally loved to return to her Frank Lloyd Wright designed home in Glendora, words like that in many publications. And so it's become sort of a suburban myth. So that raises the question. Was there ever such a place? Wright designed a number of buildings in California, but there's no definitive record of one of his designs in Glendora. Another possibility could be that Lloyd Wright, Frank's son, Frank Lloyd Wright Jr., well known for his work in the LA region, might have been the architect, or was this all supposition? So speaking of Wright, <clears throat> I pictured here uh, a few of his buildings. A recent article in the Smithsonian Magazine described Wright as America's greatest architect and egotist. Um, and the, in this case, uh, as far as the ego is concerned, one thing is true about Wright. He did have an ego, but he also was a genuine genius. Uh, two of these buildings, the Millard House, also called La Miniatura in Pasadena, and the Ennis House in uh, Hollywood, uh, are both examples of the kinds of innovations that Wright uh, pursued. And both of these examples are of what he called the textile block system, where he used local materials to make basically concrete blocks and create the, the building. Falling Water in Western Pennsylvania is probably his best known uh, building. Uh, the Marin County Civic Center I mentioned a minute ago, this was the last building he designed. Uh, he had passed away before it actually went into construction. You can make a case that the Guggenheim Museum in New York uh, was his last project. It was the last one that he actually supervised uh, before his passing. Now the historic Park Inn in Mason City, Iowa, which by the way is a comfortable drive south of Minneapolis, is really interesting. And if you're in that region of the country, it's worth visiting. This was designed by Wright in 1910. It's the only hotel he designed that's still used for that purpose. 
uh, the right end of the, no pun intended, of the building was the actual hotel. The left end was a bank. The two buildings, when they were restored a few years ago, were combined. Uh, and interestingly enough, a, a lot of the stained glass and other furnishings of the building had disappeared. And when they started the restoration, which was promoted by the city of Mason City, uh, <clears throat> people brought these things back. And so most of what is in this building uh, is original. Uh, well worth visiting, well worth staying at. Now there are a few other things about Mason City that are interesting in an architectural sense. Uh, a few blocks away from this building <clears throat> is a creek that runs through the town and around that are arrayed a number of buildings built by Wright in one case and by his associates in uh, 10 or 12 other uh, cases. One of those uh, which looks quite a bit like the Millard House in Pasadena but was built in 1910 whereas the Millard House was built in the 1920s. Um, but that house was designed by uh, Walter Burley Griffin, who was a, an, an early associate of Wright's in his Chicago office. And he went on to design the city of Canberra, Australia. Speaking of Wright's ego, it was bruised because of that. He felt that, that uh, he had had a, a uh, commission stolen from him, which was not the case. And interesting enough, he uh, had a run in with his mentor uh, Louis Sullivan, who fired Wright <laughs> because he, he was doing commissions on the side. Um, <clears throat> but Wright never spoke to Griffin again. And Griffin, for whatever reason, ended up spending most of his career in Australia and in uh, India. And a couple other things about Mason City that are just kind of interesting if you're on a little different cultural level. This was the home of uh, Meredith Wilson, who wrote The Music Man, and his house is a museum here. And also, this is the town where the Big Bopper and Richie Valens did their final concert and crashed in an airplane outside of town. Lloyd Wright, and he went by that name rather than Frank Lloyd Wright Jr. Uh, because he wanted to be on his own, uh, designed mostly residential uh, buildings in the Los Angeles area. One of the better known ones is the Soudan House in Hollywood. It looks very forbidding on the outside, but is actually very light and airy on the interior. It's built around a, a pool and a courtyard. Uh, it's actually very attractive. Wayfarer's Chapel is better known. It's probably his best known piece of work. And uh, it's presently undergoing restoration. Now, this presentation is not about Sally Rand, of course, it's about her house, but it's worth knowing a little bit about her. Uh, she was born Helen Gould Beck in 1904 in Missouri, and she was active from 1925 until her passing in 1979. Uh, she worked as an acrobat, chorus girl, and an actress, and she became internationally famous in 1933 and 34 performing her fan and bubble dances at the Century of Progress International Exposition, or World's Fair, um, in Chicago. She connected with Glendora as early as 1925 as a result of her acting in films made in Azusa Canyon. And she was acquainted, we have uh, letters to indicate this, that she wasn't acquainted with Frank Lloyd Wright in Chicago. Now, Wright had a great number of commissions following World War II. Before the war, he had a lot of jobs, a lot of commissions, but very few were constructed. And he, was, frankly, was in pretty tough shape. But after the war, his practice really took off. Somewhere along the line here, Sally Rand apparently approached him, perhaps sent him a letter, uh, about designing a home for her during this period. He was so busy, he likely referred her to one of his apprentices, Foster Rhodes Jackson. And between 1929 and 1959, when Wright died, he had about 625 apprentices or fellows as he called them. The majority of them at Taliesin West, which he built uh, beginning in 1932 in Scottsdale. Among those was Foster Rhodes Jackson who came to Taliesin for two years beginning in 1944, 
following a career as a submariner during the war. He was an executive officer of a submarine. He was born in Massachusetts in 1911. He graduated from MIT in 1934 with a degree in architecture. And he worked for his father's architectural firm in the Boston area from 34 to 38. Moving to Southern California after the war, Jackson established his own practice in Chino in the late 40s, and he became very involved with a variety of arts and design organizations in what we now call the Inland Empire. He was a member of the Arts Collective, which is associated with the Claremont Colleges, uh, and which was very prominent uh, following World War II and the second half of the 20th century. The most prominent members of that group were Miller Sheets and Sam Maloof. Jackson died in 1998. Now, Millard Sheets uh, is best known as an artist and a designer, but he also was active as an architect. He maintained studios on Foothill Boulevard in Claremont. They're still there. Uh, they are on the north side of uh, Foothill Boulevard, east of Indian Hill. Uh, it's now a dental office, but still exists. And at Padua Hills in, in north of Claremont. Some of his work is considered to be truly iconic. Here is one of his paintings. Um, he had an association with Howard Amundsen, who owned Home Savings, and so he designed uh, most of Home Savings offices. And probably his most famous work, or one that certainly people are aware of more than any, uh, similar to Falling Water with Wright, is the Word of Life mosaic, which fills the end wall of the library at the University of Notre Dame. Most people are familiar with it because if you watch Notre Dame football, sooner or later, the camera swings around to show this building which overlooks the football stadium, and hence the name Touchdown Jesus. Sam Maloof was internationally famous as a designer and builder of unique uh, furniture. His studio is still open for tours in Alva Loma. It's at the top of Carnelian Avenue, and his apprentices carry on his work today. Among his admirers and, and uh, clients were John Kennedy. In fact, I think that's where I first heard about Maloof with his, Kennedy's rocking chair and Jimmy Carter. Some of Jackson's houses, including his own, incorporated work by Maloof. Now Jackson designed more than 100 buildings during his career, all in Southern California, the majority of them in the Inland Empire. The Claremont Heritage Organization, their historical society, is in the process of cataloging and uh, identifying uh, the buildings that he built uh, in the Inland Empire, which is, turns out to be a fairly difficult process. He seemed relatively unknown until some of his houses, uh, including his own, came on the market in the past two uh, decades. I, <clears throat> Forgotten Modern by Ellen Hess, uh, which was published in 2007 and surveyed mid-century modern architecture in California, noted the work of Jackson with a description of Jackson's home in the lower left here, which is in the hills above Laverne, overlooks the uh, reservoir there, and was recently on the market for $5 million. And <clears throat> a brief reference to a residence for Miss Sally Rand. Now, Jackson wrote two books, Architecture and the Arts and the Creative Act. And in these, he set out the philosophical aspects of his craft, as well as their application in designing a building. In general, these paralleled the ideas of right in terms of organic design, where the structure should reflect its site. Example of that is the prairie style, where the building mimicked the flat terrain and integrated uh, repetitive geometric shapes, such as triangles. We'll make reference to these things as we go along. Now, some quotes from Jackson, which are revealing, I think. Um, first, I shall design them what I believe, them being his clients, to be right and as near true architecture as I am able. And he said this and wrote this while he was working for his father in the 1930s in Boston. If they are unconvinced by the design, explanations, and logic, which I doubt, I will not do them the little colonial cottage they think they want. Jackson expressed frustration at designing colonial cottages with his dad. And this design on the left here 
was an indication of his ideas even before he joined Wright in Arizona. This was for a house, I don't think it was built, I can't find any evidence that it was, um, but um, it reflects ideas of Wright, so it's obvious that Jackson was studying Wright uh, in the early part of his career. Take a mental note, particularly of the garden elevation at the top. We're gonna reference back to that a little later. And near the end of the war, <clears throat> Jackson wrote to Wright. He says, you have been the guiding light, light of my life for over 10 years, which again, connects here to the Queen House. You perhaps wonder that feeling as I do, I haven't come to Taliesin. To do this has always been one of my greatest hopes. About 1934, I wrote to Taliesin about the fellowship, but did not have the money and was considerably in debt at that time. However, I'm now out of debt and financially sound. And he believed that it was nearly miraculous that he should be introduced to Wright, and he quickly picked up on the belief system that Wright carried, extending thankfulness when he experienced personal breakthroughs. Quote, I am most grateful to you, our beloved master, through whom this joy of creative understanding has come. Some of Jackson's work shows an obvious right pedigree. Left and left below is Jackson's Claremont Professional Building. If you're familiar with Walter's Restaurant, it occupies the north end of the building where those red cars are. And in the photo on the lower right is Frank Lloyd Wright's Conjured Medical Building in San Luis Obispo. You can see the similarities. Both of these are good representatives, actually, of the prairie style. The Herb Half Home above and the Lindley Mason Studio, both in Claremont, were designed by Jackson. And notice the similarities between these structures and Taliesin West in Scottsdale. Now, Sally Rand's parents, uh, Ernest and Annette Kisling, owned a 40-acre orange and lemon orchard at the southwest corner of the intersection of Glendora Avenue, or excuse me, Glendora Mountain Road and Sierra Madre Avenue, as indicated on this uh, map with the shaded area. On the right here is a photo of Sally, her mom, and her son, Sean. Now, when I first pursued this, it occurred to me that since I had found out that Jackson had done a lot of his work in and around Claremont, that Claremont Heritage might be a good place to start a search. So I contacted them and I was invited out to join them. As it turned out, one of their interns was putting together a senior paper. She was a, a student at Scripps College at the time uh, on Jackson. So they had a lot of material. And so David Shear, the uh, uh, executive director said, yeah, come on out. I'll share what we have. And he laid this, when I got there, this was laid out on a table uh, in, the, in their office. And he said, here's the floor plan. And I'm looking at it and I, I knew enough by then that this wasn't the floor plan for Sally's house. What the situation was, was that Jackson had designed a house for the Kislings. This was it. And it had a separate bedroom wing for, 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 with rooms for Sally and Sean and other family members, but it was not the house that was built on the site. This was never constructed. Now, <clears throat> the only photo we have, that we, at least that we can find, of Sally's house is the one that appeared in the Progress Bulletin uh, in August of 54. And earlier the previous month, uh, was the photograph and the article on the left, the dream home, dream home design for Sally Rand. And <clears throat> in the photo, Mike Arrowsmith, who was the son of DM Arrowsmith, who built the house, fan dancer, as it says in the caption, Sally Rand and Foster Rhodes Jackson look over plans as above the three segments of the house are prepared for transport, looking like fantastic circus wagons from Monte Vista to Los Angeles via Valley Boulevard and Puente. Monte Vista was considered to be part of Ontario, it was unincorporated at the time. It eventually became part of Montclair when Montclair was incorporated. And it uh, uh, was basically in the area of Monte Vista Avenue today, 
and the 10 freeway. Valley Boulevard was the major, in, the, in 1954, the major east-west artery through the Pomona and uh, San Gabriel Valleys. The sketch of Sally Rand's home, which we've seen earlier, this is the front or the south uh, elevation as designed by Jackson, appears in a number of publications. It's included in a portfolio of Jackson's blueprints of the project, which are out at Claremont Heritage. And note the similarities, in particular the roof bents or the roof supports uh, to Taliesin's uh, or Taliesin West, designed by Wright, where Jackson apprenticed. Note also the similarities with the Queen House that Jackson designed prior to the war. <clears throat> and Jackson's, not Frank Lloyd Wright's, Sally Rand residence, was built in Ontario, trucked to Los Angeles in three pieces and put on display at the California Living Show at the Pan Pacific Auditorium in the Fairfax District in August of 1954, and then reassembled on the Kisling property in October of 1954. We have no photos, as I mentioned, of the building in place, either in Los Angeles or Glendora, but there was a brochure published in connection with this exhibition, and we have some illustrations from that. Uh, this is the south elevation of the house shown here, similar to the picture we saw earlier. I have a couple images of the Pan Pacific Auditorium, which was a major exhibition and performance venue uh, until the construction of the sports arena in 1960 and then subsequently other arenas in Los Angeles. Note in the lower right of the article here that Sally Rand will fly in daily from her Las Vegas engagement to make personal appearances at the house. That was one of the draws of this exhibition and the house itself. In the home magazine of the Times <clears throat> on August 8th of 54, they had a discussion, uh, illustration of, the, of this building. And this is what they said. This house is not in the contemporary style. It is modern in that it is not traditional, but it is not in the style of any of the contemporary or modern trends as such. It is an entity in itself. Here in the middle, we have a floor plan of the, of the house. A couple things we'll note here, and we'll take a look at this later in the presentation. But notice the living room uh, has a dining area connected with it and a TV alcove. Uh, consider this was 1954 that they set aside, he, or Jackson did, set aside a space uh, for television watching. There was one large bedroom, as you see, and a study. More on those later. Now, <clears throat> I highlighted the uh, little portion of this article here from the Valley Times about uh, Jackson and, this, and the exhibition and so on. But what's also interesting, actually, is the next paragraph that says this the most modern of contemporary accessories in ceramics, lamps, paintings, and art objects will vie for attention with the $5 million antique collection, which will also be part of the California Living Show. Interesting juxtaposition. Some other views, this was the master bedroom. There was a blue color palette that was used uh, throughout the, the house. This is the living room. You can see the TV alcove at the far end. The left-hand side would be the south side of the house, uh, all glass, allowing a tremendous amount of light in. And then the roof was a slab, but it was slanted on those bents. So it also allowed light through skylights. So it was a very bright home. Murphy Oldsmobile, which no longer exists, uh, had a tie-in as well. They exhibited uh, the latest Rocket 88s and 98s Oldsmobiles at Sally Rand's ultra-modern model home at the Pacific, Pan Pacific Auditorium. Now the, Jackson, the house that Jackson designed was located <clears throat> at 615 Glendora Mountain Road on an eastern portion of Sean's grandparents' 40-acre orange orchard and ranch, which was at a street address of 1434 East Sierra Madre Avenue. House was set on a raised foundation in October of 1954. It was a single story with extensive glass walls, 17 sliding glass doors, generally fa facing south, skylights as well. 
It featured cork flooring and redwood tongue and groove walls and finishes, which were both common materials at the time, especially in so-called modern homes. The south end of the house contained a large living area, which we've talked about, and the TV room. Uh, <clears throat> this would be called an open concept today, especially if you watch uh, HDTV. Uh, there was a large single bedroom with bath and a small eight by 10 studio with bath on the west side of the house that was used as Sean's bedroom. Sally was apparently visit, according to Sean, said he, he, she got a lot of visitors of, by friends from out of town. And so she could truthfully say that she had no room to put them up for the night. For the most part, the walls on the east or the back side of the house were solid and constructed one by eight redwood set at a 45 degree angle to each other like an accordion or zigzag shape on its side. The roof was a flat slab over the entire structure with an overhang extending as much as 11 feet from the south and west sides of the home. There were 1,924 square feet in the house proper and 618 feet of carport storage and service yard. Now, I just included this because this was rather bizarre and even the Times must have thought it was. It says, don't ask us what Sally Rand is doing with the tire of a trailer transporting her home to a Los Angeles home show, but it's an intriguing scene. So <clears throat> this is an article, again, about uh, the transportation of the house to Los Angeles. These are two letters <clears throat> that Rand or excuse me, that Jackson sent to Sally Rand. One is lower left is the bill for services, $2,200 for designing the uh, building and the supervision of construction and, and uh, uh, setting it down on its foundation and other charges a total of $2,200. Incredible bargain even for 1954, one could say. This is a letter that <clears throat> Foster Rhodes Jackson sent to Sally uh, it says, I've not written for so long, this was October 19th of 54, because progress on the project has been slow and there's been little to report. The foundations are finished <clears throat> to the point where we are ready to set the house down. Thomas, who I, we assume was the foreman, was supposed to set it down yesterday afternoon. I will get over to Glendora and check on it in a day or so. But kindest regards to you and Lala, that would be Fred Lala, uh, Sally's third husband, who she had married uh, a few weeks earlier, actually, uh, in uh, Las Vegas. Here is a photo from 1960, an aerial photo of the Kisling property. And, <clears throat> pardon, Sierra Madre uh, runs across the north side of the house, or north side of the property, as I should say, and GMR on the east side. The cluster of trees in the upper part of the picture is where the Kisling Orchard House was. And the red area that shaded in uh, it was the footprint of Sally Rand's house, the Jackson designed house. On the right is another floor plan oriented the same way as the house in the photo. And you can see the living room, of course, Sally's bedroom and Sean's room, the study uh, outlined. This is a current aerial photo of the same territory. Outlined, the yellow line outlines the Kisling Ranch, and the, the red indicates the footprint of Sally Rand's house. The property was sold in the 1970s. It's a little bit vague as to exactly when. It was sold to one developer. He apparently went out of business. It, the property went to another developer who eventually subdivided it, much as we see it today. And the materials in her house, such as the redwood interior, the glass doors, the walls were removed, and the foundation, the shell of the structure were demolished, and the land was sub subdivided. From this vantage point in the photo below, which shows the east end of the cul-de-sac immediately south um, of Sierra Madre Avenue on GMR, uh, this would, if we stood here, we'd be looking at the back side and east side of the house. The all glass side of the house would have been to our left. Now, Sean related that once the house was positioned on its foundation, apparently there was a lack of proper alignment of, alignment of the sections and it caused the roof to leak. 
And in a sense, this confirms the ultimate writing and pedigree of this house. I was in <clears throat> Reading a number of years ago for a geography conference. I knew that he had designed, that is right, had designed uh, a church, the Plymouth Congregational Church, uh, west of the city. And so on a Saturday afternoon, I drove out to take a look. And these are two pictures of that, that building. He never, Wright never actually came here. He, he had a, an acquaintance uh, who was part of the congregation. That individual contacted, contacted Wright and Wright basically sketched this out. And then the congregants built the house. And so when I visited, they, were, they had a meeting there and it was breaking up and there was a fellow walking along and I engaged him in conversation and explained my background and my interest and so on. And it turned out he was the engineer who, who did the engineering on this project. And first thing out of his mouth after I told him what my interest was, was did all of his buildings leak? And some of them did for certain. The Barnstall House in Hollywood did originally. Uh, it's, it was just recently totally restored. It doesn't leak now as far as I know. I haven't had much rain though. Uh, and the Johnson Wax building, which, by the way, is another great example of Wright's innovations. He, he was the first one to use uh, pre-stressed concrete uh, extensively in buildings of this scale. Uh, columns inside the main room have a base six inches in diameter. And people thought, no way they could support this building. But in fact, they can support weights that are much many times what is put upon them by this uh, structure. In any event, it leaked also. So in a sense, this is right in. And it's, I think, worth noting also about Wright is that he had some peculiarities in terms of design. If the thing leaked, well, that was, that was what you got when you, you dealt with a genius because you also got a, a building that was unique. Uh, but also, some of his ceilings were rather low uh, because he was relatively short. And the kitchen in most of the homes he designed was small because that wasn't a concern of his. The big concern really was the living area. And interesting enough, that was true of uh, Sally Rand's place as well, designed by Jackson. Now, what does this all mean? Well, as far as Jackson was concerned, the Claremont Courier, as early as February of 1947, interestingly enough, and so Jackson's uh, <clears throat> practice had only been in the area for about a year, uh, but they said of him, Jackson was indeed a student of Frank Lloyd Wright. The organic modern style is evidence of that, and many of his designs demonstrate his ability to combine architecture, craft, engineering, and construction and artistry to form a beautiful and distinct work. Now, in the upper left is Our Lady of Guadalupe Church in uh, Chino. Doesn't look particularly Wrightian or Jacksonian, uh, but Wright designed some things too that didn't fit the mold, if you will. The Parker House is a certainly a modern house. Uh, elements of Wright in there for sure, uh, but the McLeod House in Claremont, certainly a better example of the right connection, if you will. And by the way, eventually Jackson did move his practice to uh, Claremont because most of his work was in that area. Uh, as far as Sally Rand is concerned, she'd continue to perform for most of her life. She lived in a home directly across the street from the Glendora Historical Museum, it's still there. Uh, many of her artifacts are found at the museum, as well as up at Rubel Castle, where she and Dorothy Rubel, who was the mother of Mike, uh, would host many parties in what is called today the Tin Palace. She, a couple of quotes from her. I am the original, and I have never retired. I've averaged 40 working weeks a year since 1933. And sometimes people think she was rather tall. She was actually barely over five feet, and a tiny woman, petite, here are size three shoes. Probably the best biography of her is Barefoot to the Chin, and it's available uh, from the society, both at the museum and at the castle, and online. 
just another point about her. Uh, we, a lot of us around Glendora know about her uh, because she lived here, but, and also the connection with uh, the Rubels. But there are at least two Sally Rand impersonators in the country who still perform. And in fact, some of us on the board of the Society have talked about bringing one of them to Glendora for an, a, a fundraising event um, someday, not right now, unfortunately. So that raises other questions. What if, what if there had been more of a preservation ethic in the 1970s, generally in the region and in Glendora in particular? Perhaps Sally's right house uh, would still be here for us to experience and appreciate. And we'd be asking the question, do you know about Sally Rand Foster Rhodes Jackson House? What can we learn from this? Well, we can certainly speculate. This was essentially a modular dwelling. And we have to wonder, was Jackson experimenting with an idea for a mass produced house for the less affluent as Wright did with his Usonian concept uh, example shown here? It's worth noting that during the war, there was a lot of prefab construction of, of housing. And as recently as the Nixon administration, when George Romney was head of uh, HUD, that administration and Romney himself promoted home construction on a modular basis, factory built housing uh, to reduce the cost of housing. And that's still a concept that's around today. Uh, there is a, an architect in the Bay Area that designs modular homes, and there are companies in other parts of the country as well who do that. I have two nephews in Massachusetts, both of whom live in uh, modular homes. Had the large Kisling residence been built, would we have three architecturally important buildings in Glendora today? They'd be the Kisling House, the Wallace Neff designed so-called Singer Mansion and Rubel Castle. A project like this doesn't get done with help from a lot of sources and a lot of people. Sean Rand was absolutely critical to making this thing a success. I enjoyed talking with him, had many interviews with him. He reviewed the material for, for accuracy. He was a rock. The Historical Society, Sandy Kraus and Barrett uh, Oliver for the question and constant encouragement, and Karen Garcia, who's our museum curator, and Lori Merriman, uh, who works in our archives, found uh, photos and the critical thing, the California Living Brochure, and it's the only copy that we know exists. Claremont Heritage, they, they were absolutely critical as well because of the papers and materials they had of Jackson. It turned out that Scheer and David Hess, the writer of the modern of the uh, book on uh, mid-century modern in California, um, had a connection. And when Hess was finished with his research, he turned over the Jackson material to Scheer and Claremont Heritage. So that was dumb luck that that all came together. The material on Sally Rand, the letters and so on, came from the Chicago History Museum that has Sally Rand papers for covering most of her life. And Ellen Keith not only accessed those, but sent them to me for free. Uh, Pomona Public Library, Al Lincoln Bay, came up with those articles on the Dream Home. And my wife is critical for editing and making suggestions about these kinds of programs. This is about the seventh or eighth iteration of this program, uh, and it's partially thanks to her efforts. So finally, these are the sources. Finally, I'd like to thank Cindy Romero and uh, Gaetano Abadanza at the library who made this all possible, and hope you enjoy it. If you have questions, you can contact me through the uh, contact information for the society, and I'll be happy to respond. Thank you very much for joining us. Goodbye.